Their religious system was a man-centered, ritualistic, and it was outward-focused. In our day, we would refer to them as legalists. They were always adding to the requirements. They were going beyond Scripture. I think a, a helpful way to think about that is we think about fences that are built. And this, you've heard this analogy before, but you, you build a fence to protect something. And so what the, uh, and we, we do that sometimes, we may do that in a, in a very helpful way. You know, if I, if, if I don't want to uh, go into a particular sin, I don't want to be tempted in that particular sin, I may build a fence. I, I may say, I'm not going to do this. Uh, for example, I may say, well, you know, I'm never going to be alone with a woman outside of my wife or a family member, a child, grandchild. I'm not going to be uh, alone with a female so that I don't even want to take on the appearance of evil or I, I, I want to be careful about falling into temptation. And I can build that fence around there and that can be a helpful thing. The problem is is that while that's a helpful thing, the problem is, is when we make that fence the law, when we say that this is equal to God's Word, and that's what they were doing. They were building these fences so that you would not sin, but essentially what they began to do is build a system where the fences became the law, where the fences became the Scripture, and they were not equal to Scripture. In fact, they were always going beyond Scripture, and they were always weighing down the people with these heavy burdens and saying that you must do this if you want to be pleasing in the sight of God. Again, we would refer to them as legalists. But now our Lord enters this world, and the contrast is glaring. Instead of a a human effort and religious rituals based on tradition, and by the way, we're going to talk a little bit about tradition, and and I'll say this, that tradition in itself is not all bad. It's just like the fences. The the fences in themselves are not all bad. Tradition is not bad. I'm looking out, and we got a lot of folks that are missing here, but you've all went back to your seats where you traditionally sit. Hello? Hello? I mean, there, there, there's, there, there can be, in fact, Paul, Paul talks about tradition in a very positive sense, and he uh, incorporates it with the, his, his teachings. Traditions in itself are not bad. The problem, again, is just like with those fences, is when traditions begin to be on the same level as Scripture. It can be based upon Scripture, but we cannot equate it with Scripture. So, instead of human effort and religious rituals based on tradition, our our Lord taught that salvation is based upon divine accomplishment, resulting in a right relationship with God. It's based upon truth. In, In summary, it's the truth that our Lord's religious system was based upon, or I should say is based upon. And it is falsehood and error that all other religious systems are based upon. We can sum it up this way. There are basically two kinds of religion. There is the true religion, which is placing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is His divine accomplishment. It is His person and His work, what He's done on our behalf. Or it is works. That's it. It, it is, and, you, and you look at every system, and, and ours is a system of grace. It is based upon faith by grace, and, and so by grace through faith that we come to Christ, whereas every other system is earning. It is a works-based. So there is a right way and a wrong way. And that Christianity, and this is, it speaks of the exclusivity of Christianity, and this is really how this message ends. Not that I'm ending yet. (laughs) But there is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And even as I say that, I understand the implications of that. 
Uh, someone says, well, that's, that's very narrow to think that way. Well, that puts me in good company. I, that's the way Jesus taught. He says, I am the way, the truth. No one can come to the Father except through me. It is narrow. The Scripture is very narrow in that way. It, uh, G, Paul, it, 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 he teaches that it is very narrow. I mentioned before, but my, my preaching professor used to say that Baptists ought to be so narrow that we could sleep seven to a bed. I mean, that's narrow. We're narrow. And we're narrow because that's what the Scripture teaches. So I'll speak more about that exclusivity at the very end of this. It's really a simple message. I, I don't want to make it too complicated. This looks like some of it we might have, a, a, as we're kind of piecing it together, no pun intended, it looks like it may be a little difficult, but really it's very simple. There are really two questions that are here, the questions that we see that the Pharisees ask of Jesus. There's one question there, and then Jesus comes back with a rhetorical question. What's interesting is, is that their question is a Really, really it is an accusation in the form of a question, whereas Jesus answers with a question in the form of a metaphor or an analogy, and then he gives a series of illustrations. Let's don't make it complicated. Let's just look at it very simply, but I want you to notice how this begins in verse number 33, and notice what it says. It says, and they, and I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Because the and tells us that it's tied to the previous section. So it's, the, it's an accusation that they're going to ask in this, but as you look at this and, it reminds us that this is part of the same story. And we began this story last time that we were here. And you recall that the setting is, is that uh, Levi the tax collector, we better know him as, as Matthew. You recall that he had left his... Uh, tax booth, and he began to follow Jesus. And it, it says that he left everything, and it, so he's a devoted follower of Jesus because he, he's left everything to follow Christ. And then, it, and then we read in that passage of Scripture that he, in his house, he gave a big party, and it says for him, it was for Jesus. And he invites all his friends, and all of his friends were tax collectors and sinners, and you recall that as we looked at that last time, by the way, that's, that's what happens is when you become a devoted follower of Jesus, what you want to do naturally is invite all of your friends to meet Jesus. That's what Levi does. So they're there, and then we saw the Pharisees, and this is how this ties to this, is that the Pharisees, so after the party, we, we summarized that it was either out in the yard or probably after the party because the Pharisees would not have attended that party because there were sinners and tax collectors, and that was their question. Why would you be hanging out with those folks? That's not their view of the Messiah. That's not their view of God. And we noted that he's not entering into their sin, but he is entering into engaging them drawing them unto himself. So the Pharisees are asking these questions. So they've left the house, probably a big house. They've, they've left the house, and this is where we pick up in verse number 33. And they said to him, they, they being the Pharisees, and I picked that up from verse 30. They had asked a question earlier where they were grumbling, but now they're asking another question, they. So it's the Pharisees and the scribes, and in Matthew's account, there's a third party that's there, and that is the, the disciples of John the Baptist. They're in there. So evidently, some followers of John the Baptist had followed Jesus, but there were others that were followers of John who had not yet, they were maybe in in between about whether or not they should follow him, and so they were still following John, and Matthew points out in his account that they were there. They were among those asking questions. By the way, just, just a, a word about this, is that it, it's a reminder, that, and, and this is true of today, that there are some people that follow the preacher but never truly follow Christ. 
And, and a lot of times this becomes very evident when a preacher disappoints them. Or a preacher falls into sin and, and people will leave the faith because, because they, they have really put their hope in the preacher rather than what the preacher should be preaching and hopefully he's preaching, which is Christ. And if I have not disappointed you by now, just hang in there. At some point, I will disappoint you. Kelly said, Amen. Don't look at the preacher. The preacher is pointing you to Christ. He is one that will never disappoint. So there were some of John's disciples that were there. And they asked this question. They say, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers, and the disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours eat and drink. What, they want, what they're asking is, is they, they want to know why your disciples, he's, they're asking Jesus, why are your disciples different than the religious disciples of the day? Again, think, think about the, the there's, there's the rowdy crowd, there's the tax collectors and, and the sinners that are there, and then there's the uh, religious crowd that I mentioned, the Pharisees, scribes, and disciples of John, and, and so they're all kind of in the mix, a little bit like this group this morning. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a mix that's there, and they pose this question, but really it, it's, it's more in the form of an accusation. I, I've been in pastoral ministry over 20 years, and, and one of the things I've learned over the years in church conferences, not so much here, I mean, we, it, it has really been a, a great time that in the time that I've been here, but in years past, I have been where, where I, a lot of times I would just grip the podium, getting ready for what is the question that's going to be posed in a business meeting. And Jesus has asked this question. Again, it's, it's more about an accusation. Why? why? I mean, we, we are religious, and this is how religion looks. A couple things just to note about this. They often fast. And, and, and it may surprise you, but in the Old Testament, there is only one command to fast in the Old Testament. Now, there are times that uh, leaders would, would call upon the people to to fast, but the only command to fast in the Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement. And that, of course, is fulfilled in Christ. And so, so there, there is no... There is no command to, to fast in the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, as we think about fasting, it is on a volunteer basis. But what we see in this is that they, the, the, these disciples, they consider to be religious. In fact, again, they're always adding to the requirements. In Luke, Luke chapter 18, for example, we eventually will get there. Lord willing. There's the parable of the, the Pharisee and the publican, which is a tax collector. And, and you know in Luke chapter 18 that, that the Pharisee, and it's a parable. I mean, Jesus is very direct in what he's doing in this. He's calling out the Pharisees. But one of the Pharisees in this parable that Jesus is telling says, God, I thank you that I'm not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week. So they fasted twice a week. Now, you're not required. It's not a commandment, but they fasted twice, to, twice a week. This is, what is, this is what religion looks like. And so when they would come, in fact, tur turn to Matthew chapter 6 for just a moment. Because I want you to see it this way. They were notorious for doing what Jesus calls out on the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. They, they, the, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, they, they, they were famous for parading their righteousness before others. Now, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount 
really deals with three areas here, giving, verses 2 through 4, praying in verses 5 through 15. But I want you to go down to fasting in verse number 16. He says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites. The hypocrites we know is, is uh, you think about, we've talked about this before, they're, they're two-faced. In, in, the, in the Greek drama, they would put on a, a mask, and if they wanted to look like they had a smile on, they would have a mask that had a smile on it. Sad, they would have a tear and a sad face. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't, don't be an actor. Don't be, don't be putting on a face for others. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your hair and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. They were notorious for, for, for looking all sad and gloomy, their hair disheveled. And you look at them and you say, are, are you okay? Well, I'll tell you what, you, if you, you prayed and fasted like I did, you, you'd probably look like this too. I mean, I spend so much time with the Lord, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm spending all this time, I mean, you'd look like this as well. They, 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 they wanted to be noticed by men. They, they wanted others to see them. The, 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 the ash that would be on their face, the disheveled hair. They, they looked all gloomy. Let me, let me just put it in layman's terms. They, they looked like they were at a funeral. And this is the contrast that is being set up here for Jesus to answer his question. And notice how Jesus answers the question to what they're asking. Why is it, they say, that that these disciples, our disciples, fast and offer prayers, but yours eat and drink? Why, Why is it that your folks look like they're going to a party and they're always acting like they're at a party? And Jesus said to them, I mean, he, he doesn't miss a moment and connects it. I mean, he is just real quick to answer them back and say, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? Jesus is the bridegroom. The attendants are the disciples. How inappropriate it would be in a wedding ceremony for the groomsmen to act like they were at a funeral. And what Jesus is saying is that, and and this is what Scripture bears out, that there is joy in the presence of the bridegroom. That when we are in the presence of him, in fact, let me me just just put it differently. We, We know, for example, in Galatians 5, that the one of the marks of, of Christianity is is joy. We know that Galatians 5, that the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second one? Joy, peace, patience, and so on. We, we know that. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 11 to his disciples, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. And, and let me just bring this point home here that there is joy. You, you think about the, the moment that you were saved, when you came to faith and when you came to, to the realization of what Christ had done for you. Think about the joy that, that filled your soul at that time. Anybody, can I get a witness? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The joy that is there that comes from understanding what Christ has done on your behalf. And then, and then, we, and then we get often caught up in the cares of this world but what we see here, and, and, and the, the thing I want to emphasize is that our joy is related to our proximity of the bridegroom. In other words, if you want to have real joy in your life, then you need to get closer to Jesus. The closer you are to him, the more joy. You cannot help yourself but to have joy. 
And everything in this world is trying to rob us of our joy. Everything in, it seems like everything that is trying to distract us from spending time with Him, quality time with Him. It's the, the, the airwaves, the, whether it be the radio or the television or the phones or what, whatever. All these things are distractions from time alone with Him. Now, I'm not saying go out and be a monk and, and, and move out to the mountains. I, I've thought about it, but, but, but I'm not saying that that's what we ought to do. We don't have to do that. You, you don't have to be alone to be alone with Jesus. You can be in the midst of a crowd and still be conversing. Paul talks about that we ought to pray without ceasing. I, I, I think part of that is, is being ever aware of his abiding presence. But I am saying there ought to be that we're looking to spend time with him. I got, I got to hurry because I'm just at the very beginning of this and there's so much here. But, but there is joy. And one of the marks of being a disciple of, of Christ is that there's joy. He uses this imagery. Jesus uses this imagery of the bridegroom. We know this fleshes it out. Like, for example, in Ephesians 5, Paul talks about Christ being, or us being the bride of, of Christ. And we see this elsewhere. But he's using this, this wedding motif through the rest of this passage. And I, I'll show you how that fits in a moment. A couple of things I want you to notice in here, looking at verse number 35, because this is really, he, he, he's telling them, you, you ought to expect this. That if you're at a, a wedding, you ought not act like you're at a funeral. If you're in the presence of the bridegroom, then it's a time of celebration. His disciples were spending time with Jesus, and as such, there should be an overflow of joy there. There should be, we know that Paul makes it very clear that the kingdom of heaven is not about eating and drinking, Romans 14, 17, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What do you, what do you see at a wedding? You see joy, right? You see dancing? But aren't we Baptists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it may surprise you. I did dance at our, when our daughter was, was married. Uh, and then there are, there's dancing, and then, you know, then there's dancing. But, I mean, we, we were dancing. So, so yeah, it, it, was, it was what you might expect. Not that good. I thought. But they're singing. You remember the old song? I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Yeah, you, you remember that. I mean, there, there's joy. We, we ought to be the most joyous people in the world. And yet, sometimes we look like we're attending a funeral. He does say there is a time for fasting. In fact, verse 35, and, and this is really a cloaked or, or really a, a veiled prophecy of what's going to take place. He says, but the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. Uh, taken away. There is, there is coming a time where, where Jesus would be snatched away from the disciples. He would be arrested, and, and we know that he would go through a a mock trial and uh, would be scourged and crucified. And there was great sorrow. There was fasting during that time. And so there is a time of that. There are seasons in our life where maybe death or maybe there's a, a spiritual matter that we're praying about something that we voluntarily fast for. But by and large, our life ought to be marked by joy. There ought to be joy. There's something wrong with a Christian if there's not joy. Again, there are seasons. We know that there are seasons, but by and large, our life ought to be marked by joy. He continues with this analogy. Really, I mean, it's, it's, it's not far from being removed, but he's talking about, he gives two illustrations in the form of parables, and a parable that we know that is just laying a truth beside a story. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment 
and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. You think about, ladies, if you had a brand new dress and uh, your old dress was, was, uh, had a rip in it, you would not go to that new dress and, and cut out a piece of the new dress and patch it to the old dress, would you? Because, I mean, it, it would be glaringly obvious that something's wrong there. You would, you would see. In fact, the old dress, uh, which has been laundered, has, has through time, it, the, the colors faded, and, and uh, uh, if it's been washed, it, it, it begins to lose its elasticity. Well, I can't even say that word. It's not elastic anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, so, and the, fr- and the fibers start to fall apart. I mean, you know, the, it, 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 becomes, it becomes old. Yeah. And so you don't, you don't patch something new to it. But because it, 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 it breathes and, and it's able to, 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 it has elastic and it's able to move. And, and, and so it was, it's going to rip its way away from that. And, and the same analogy he uses with the new wine and the old wineskins. The old wineskins taken from, from animal skins that they would, pour the, uh, they would pour new wine into new wineskins for the same reason, so that it would expand and, and it would breathe. And, and, but through time, as, it, as the... Uh, the gases would come off, and, and as the, the, the wine would begin to ferment, it would, it would expand such that it was able to expand anymore, become dry. And so if you, put, if you took that wine out and you put new wine in the old wineskins, then it would cause them to rip, or tear, or to burst. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Well, what does all this mean? I mean, how does this fit with what he's been saying and what he's been teaching? And I think just to sum it up, what he's telling us is that the, the kingdom of God, the gospel, if you will, that you, you cannot mix Christianity with other religious systems. Now, let me say what he's not saying here. He's not, Jesus is not saying that I have come to replace the Old Testament, that the Old Testament is to be done away with, and that this is the new religion and it is Christianity. On the contrary, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. But they had built a religious system. They had a man-made religious system where they had worked out what you've got to do in order to please God, in order to go to heaven, in order to be acceptable before God on the day of judgment. And what needs to happen is that the old has to be discarded. And it is only the new. To put it in a different analogy, we need the heart, which is a heart of stone, needs to be replaced with a heart of flesh. All of this is illustrating the same thing, that you cannot add Jesus to any religious system. Now, we tend to think about syncretism in a very formal sense. You say, what what, what are you talking about? Well, we think about religious systems, and when we think about religious systems, we think about blending them. You go out and you you tell everybody, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, and they say, well, I'm I'm this, I'm a Buddhist, or I'm, I'm uh, on another trek, and, and, but we're all on the same road. No. No, we're not. You, you cannot mix anything with Christianity. It is in Christ and Christ alone. You cannot patch the old with the new. And this gets into what they were doing. The, they, had the, they had built the religious... Uh, rituals up to the point where this is what we have to do in order to be right before God. And what Jesus is teaching is that you need to throw the old garment away. You need to throw the old wineskins away. And the new wineskin. The new wine. 
And the new garment is Christ. Christ is the one who clothes us in righteousness. Christ is the one who gave his life on our behalf. When we think we take in a moment the Lord's table, that the, that the wine represents the blood of Christ. Let's get to the last verse in there. We're going to finish right on time, Barry. Verse 39. Having said that new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. By the way, just one last thing. Again, wine signifying joy. Have you ever noticed that there there is no joy in a legalistic religious system? You you think about the legalists that you know. You got to do this. You got to do this. Can't do this. Can't do. There's an absence of joy. Have you noted that? Have you noted? I mean, I mean, legalism, there is no joy. But isn't there a joy in the freedom that we have in the gospel? The freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. Verse 39, and, and no one, it, it took, took me a little time here, and no one after drinking old wine wishes for new. For he says the old is good enough. What, what is that saying? What, what, what's he emphasizing here? Again, looking at the, the, the current people that he is addressing, they loved their old religious system. They, they loved their religious rituals. It, it, it made them feel important. It, it made them feel like they were righteous before others. Jesus said, that's your reward. But they were satisfied with that, such that they rejected Jesus. They didn't want the new wine that he was offering. When I was in the grocery business, we used to have a problem where where people would come in and and steal from the store. One One of the things that they would steal, we would have drunkards would come in and they would they would steal rubbing alcohol sometimes and and aftershave lotion for the purpose of drinking it. Now, I, I know that stuff will kill you. And, but their, their, their senses were so dull. They would, I know you could pour it through a cloth and different things, but, but, but the point being, their senses were so dull that they, they could drink this stuff. And, and they were just looking for the high that came from it. Taste didn't matter. It, it, didn't, it didn't matter what it tasted like. They had dulled their senses in such a way that all they wanted was the alcohol. And these religious leaders of their day, their senses had become, spiritual senses had become so dull that all they had a taste for was a righteousness that was practiced before men. They they didn't want what Jesus was offering. They didn't want grace. You say, who wouldn't want grace? Those who are proud and those who are arrogant, those who, who, who will not admit that there is something wrong with me before God, that that spiritually, that I'm not good enough. We often talk about this, about repenting from our sin, but the truth is we need to just as much so repent from our good works. We have nothing to offer God. As the songwriter put it, nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. There is nothing that we can bring before God. Some people have dulled their senses, their senses, their spiritual senses in such a way. They don't want free grace. They don't want the offer of the gospel. No, they reject it. What does it take? What does it take for someone to receive the good news of the gospel? May I just say it takes a miracle? That it takes the grace of God, and if you have by faith trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is by grace that you've done so. And we ought to thank God that we have been brought into close proximity to the bridegroom by grace. Well, I had four questions I was going to end with, and 
Not going to have time to get there today. But I would, I would just ask one, based on what we see here in this passage. And that is, by, by, by what authority are you, uh, is your view of God being informed by? I'm not supposed to end with a preposition, but... Let me, let me ask it this way. When, when you think about who God is... What, what, do you, what do you look to as the authority? Or, or, because if you say, well, I just don't believe in, in your reasoning, and I say, I don't believe that God would be that way, and that's the authority, then what you will end up doing is you will always end up with an image of God that is just like you. You'll, you'll always do that. My God wouldn't do this. Well, no, your God wouldn't because that's not the God of the Bible. That's the God of your imagination. What informs you about who God is? And, and, and if it's not the Scriptures, then what? And the Scriptures teaches the exclusivity that there's only one way that we must come to Him. So the question that I have for us in closing is, have you come through the narrow gate? Have you taken the narrow path? Have you, have you come to... God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mark of that is that there is a joy that is in your life. Do you know of the joy of the Lord? Have you experienced that? Even today? Or can you say that my life today is marked by joy? And if not, then I would say repent and believe on the gospel again and return to the Lord, that he might restore the joy of your salvation. Will you stand with me for prayer? As we bow our heads to to pray, uh, just take a moment there. just to converse with the Lord, and then I'll pray for us. Father, I do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do recognize, even as we have read in this passage of Scripture, that there is a difference between those who are followers of you and those who are trying to earn their merit and standing before you. Lord, I pray that all of us have come to the understanding that we can rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he alone has provided salvation for sinners. And I pray that having rested in him, that we would desire to spend time with him, to know him more intimately and become even deeper acquainted with him. And that as a result, that our life would be characterized by joy. Lord, we ask this, that we might reflect Him and that we might be used as instruments of grace to draw others to You. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.